This card has an interesting story to it, originally involving me finding it on eBay along with two other cards for sale. And well, it didn't turn out to be the card I thought it was. In fact, it was even better than I thought it would be. Here we have the AMD Radeon R5 240, a card that is probably hated among the masses of you. But hey, wait, we haven't even spoke about the price yet. This bundle of graphics cards cost me £4, and I already sold the other two for £5 each, meaning that I got paid to take this card, so it cost me minus £6. It is based on the Orland GCN architecture and has 320 cores, and a core clock that comes in at 730MHz. It also has 1GB of GDDR3 VRAM, which comes clocked in at 900MHz, so it's fairly basic in terms of specifications, and raw power-wise it struggles to combat itself against the ancient 9800 GT. It does, however, have a meager TDP of 20 watts, meaning it can fit into any system, and considering this is the Dell OEM version, it means you can stick it in any OEM PC, as it's likely below the power requirements. It is, however, fairly new and still receives driver updates regularly thanks to the advanced GCN architecture it uses. And more than this, it is still available today, but not at a price you'll be happy to hear of, as it released for an RRP of £49 or $55, US but then again, Dell is still selling these bad boys new for 60 bucks. So yeah, they're not exactly best value new. Now the reason for the hate on these cars is usually the price, as there is usually never a bad product and just a bad price. Unless it's the game Bad Rats, then that's just a bad product and shouldn't exist. But still, this harks home here, as this really isn't actually a bad product, it's just got a terrible release price. But considering I got paid to take this card off me, I'm not going to complain how much I spent on it, so this is completely unbiased from the pricing perspective. And recently I noticed a lot of these cards are going for under £20 or $22, US, but does that mean they're any good at that price? Now this card is exactly the same as the R7 240, which was released by aftermarket companies, and usually features worse cooling than the OEM variant, which is really quite odd, as this is comprised entirely of copper, as well as having some decent binning on the chip, which means that the OEM ones are renowned for their overclocking ability. And aside from that, there's no real reason to opt between either of these graphics cards unless you plan to overclock, in which case the OEM version is definitely the better one to look out for. And most sites show that the cards are virtually the same in benchmarks at stock speeds, but seeing as we're the best over here, we've decided to see how much it will overclock, and we got around 1000 MHz on core and 1300 MHz on memory, which is a nice stable overclock and I ran it for a while in some tests and it didn't really heat up above 56 degrees, so it was completely fine in terms of temperatures and stability. But the thing is, a card might be stable, but does it actually mean it's any good in games? Let's find out. Up first we have Prey from 2017, one of the best looking and more demanding games out there today, and we ran it with a 34fps average with the low setting selected, which was way more than playable. Hardly any stuttering happened during my time playing, which can be represented by the 1% lows and 0.1% lows of 28 and 21. GTA 5, a AAA game from a few years back, ran fine with the normal option selected in the 720p resolution with an average of 40 FPS and a consistent frame rate consisting of 1% lows down to 27 FPS and 0.1% lows down to 22 FPS, so I didn't really see any issues with GTA running on this card. Sure, it's not 60 FPS, but it sure is better than the Xbox 360 version of the game. CSGO, of course, everyone's favourite esports title, ran fine in 1080p with a 92fps average, which is way more than enough for most competitive players, especially considering you could pair this with any basic SFF system, allowing you to play some of those smooth 1080p esports titles for a low price. Following this, I had Minecraft running on the PC in 1080p with high settings selected, and we averaged a nice 114fps so I can't really complain when a game is running at 1080p with over 100 FPS on average. The game could drop some frames during loading, but this is more a fault with the CPU rather than an issue with the GPU. Back to modern gaming, we have Halo 5 running with low settings in the 720p resolution, which is impressive to say the least, considering we saw an average of 31 FPS and minimums down to 16 FPS. Sure, it's not ideal and the game doesn't look too great, but for non-competitive players, it was playable in a pinch. And I mean, this is an Xbox One game, so it's pretty demanding. Early access-wise, I decided to try out Rust. 
but I found the 33 FPS delivered to be playable even when surrounded by grass and large environments. Sure, combat was a little bit sluggish, but for the most part I was able to go on alright with the game, and it is still in early access so performance can be expected to improve, and it didn't really slow down too much as I was able to enjoy the time I did have playing it. And finally to round off we have Fallout 4 which ran better than I expected, looking somewhat okay with the low preset in 720p, and running at a solid 35 FPS. I was able to traverse my way around the city which is one of the most intensive areas of the game. Sure during loading times it could hit our 1% lows down to 9 FPS, but during actual gameplay it felt smooth and was hardly stuttering at all. So there we have it, probably one of the most hated graphics cards among you, and it was probably one of the best slash worst cards I've ever used. It was the best considering I made money on it, and it's amazing how little power it does consume. But the fact it can fit in any system is what makes it nice to me but doesn't make it worth the money. Hell, some people are selling these off new for 40 or more pounds. Sure, you can get a deal on a used one, but even then you may as well go for something better like a HD8670 on R7250, which we've used before on the channel and they worked even better, so I don't see the need for this card. It's a niche little thing and sure if your PC only has like a 20 watt spare power supply or something like that, then maybe this is the card for you. But in that situation you may as well just buy a new power supply and get an even better graphics card because it gives you more longevity to the system. But for anything more than £10 or $15 you're going to have to look elsewhere as I won't recommend this card for anything more than that. So on that note, thank you very much for watching, Good night. So I have a big video coming up and that will definitely be worth hanging around for. Don't forget you can always like and subscribe for more content just like this and I'll see you guys in another video.